Um, so welcome. So, so we're talking about today, so really prevention of diabetes. And, and what I mean by that is we're going to look at uh, what, you know, what is prediabetes, what is, what is also type 2 diabetes mainly, and looking at the, uh, the practices that we can do that, that can help to delay or prevent the onset of either one of these. The agenda for today. So what are we talking about today? Uh, it, this is kind of in broad terms. Of course, what's diabetes? The prevalence of diabetes. Diabetes is a, it's a public health issue, definitely. Um, we're going to get into some detailed explanations, and I'll do my best to kind of to break it down so that we're all on the same page. We all understand what we're talking about, how it develops, and how to prevent or delay. That last section there on how to prevent and delay, if you can see my mouse here, zoom in real big, this is gonna be the power we have to, to affect change in our body. And this is, we're gonna spend a lot of time on this. Uh, just to start off with reminder, everyone, uh, of course, everything you eat, everything that's in front of you right there that you're eating, that cappuccino, that blueberry muffin is going to go into your bloodstream. And your blood's going to carry all the components of that microscopically, you know, it's already been broken down microscopically by this complicated digestive system with the purpose of delivering that food into your blood. Now the blood, like a transportation system, will deliver the nutrients from head to toe. And that's called feeding ourselves. Now, the... Uh, the process is quite complex and we won't get so much into a lot of the, a lot of those physiology and a lot of the physiology, but we do want to remind ourselves that that is what happens. The one exception there, well, maybe two exceptions would be um, fiber. So fiber is the undigestible or indigestible part of the plant, that part of the plant that humans can't break down. And it ends up traveling the full length, 20 feet of small intestine and another about five feet of colon uh, that helps form a stool, helps to clean the digestive system. And also maybe a little gristle probably could get in there too. So, okay, now that we're all on the same page, let's get started. What is diabetes? This is a disease in which your blood sugar, and we call blood sugar glucose, because it's what it is. It's actually been either converted to glucose or directly absorbed in the form of glucose into your bloodstream. And when that blood sugar is too high, this glucose is too high, and that condition is called diabetes. That is a malfunctioning of the body. It's not normal to have high blood sugar, even if we're eating a mountain of carbohydrates and a bucket of sugar, you know, our body would compensate. Of course, there'd be other consequences, but the blood sugar would stay normal. So diabetes is a dysfunction there. Now, we have, um, the blood can get really sticky and really thick, kind of like honey, or, and it irritates and inflames and damages the blood vessels and the organs. And, and one of the reasons that this happens is because the, uh, at least in the uh, tiniest of vessels, those of the eye, can you see the eye here? This is a photo of an eye, and the back here is, the back of the eye where the nerve, that's, that's called an optic nerve, but this back of the eye, this whole big part here is like a screen and it's called a retina. And that detects the light that you see and helps send the messages to the brain. These tiny, tiny vessels are called capillaries. They're tiny. And for the blood to deliver oxygen to your eye and to deliver nutrition to your eye, nutrients, that blood's got to be quite, um, what would you say, watery, I guess, not too viscous. If the sugar is high, the blood is too thick to enter those capillaries and to supply oxygen and nutrients. So you can see how you could suffocate your eye and cause eye damage with with high blood sugar and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Now, uh, th these are big vessels here, arteries here. And these, uh, when the sugar is too high, it 
is inflammatory, it inflames. I think of it as almost like sand scratching the inside of the arteries that can damage the inside of the arteries and that can allow for, for fatty plaque to build up in there. And it's a um, number of other conditions happen there. But this is basically diabetes. Now it's, the whole process is quite complex. So I think, uh, so here we have uh, Albert Einstein saying, if you don't, if you, if you don't really understand, so you don't really understand it as something until you can explain it to your grandmother. I know that we have tons of highly sophisticated grandmothers out there, everybody can, but the point of this is that this is, this is really quite, to break this issue down, this topic down is going to take some effort and it's gonna take a lot of slides. So bear with me. This is one of the few slides that's not gonna have a picture. There's about two slides here, or three slides that are just gonna be words, but I'm gonna get into more details because really it takes a lot of visual and discussion and words and pictures to fully grasp this topic. Insulin, insulin, you've heard of insulin. People say, oh, I'm taking insulin. I'm an insulin shot. Well, insulin is a hormone that your body produces to help the blood sugar uh, enter from the blood into your cells to give your cells energy. It does other things that we're gonna talk about too. But without insulin or sufficient insulin, the blood sugar would be high. In type one diabetes, the body no longer makes insulin. We're not really focused on that on this presentation. This is an autoimmune disease where your own body destroys the cells in your pancreas that produce insulin and you become dependent on that. And most cases are diagnosed before the age of 18. It seems to be, I think, ages four to seven. And I think, I uh, can't remember exactly, but I think it's 12 to 16 is another period of time when there's uh, more uh, incidence of this. Type two diabetes, the more common type, which is about 90 to 95% of the cases that we see in this country, um, this is a little bit different. So typically this begins with some level of genetic predisposition, so inherited genes, and that can be triggered. You can have genes that predispose you to diabetes and not have diabetes because of lifestyle and uh, eating and exercise habits but it can also happen um, with sometimes it almost happens uh, at a very young age because of the the genetics there is so strong it could be even uh, we've seen it in 12 year olds and i'm talking not type 1 but type 2 diabetes because of their status of their eating habits and being overweight and things like that. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so the point is type two diabetes is a more common one. This is when your body does not use insulin well. Your body's producing insulin, it is. It's just your body's not responding to it. It's not responding the way it's supposed to. There's a certain resistance to the effects of insulin. We'll be addressing more. And so the blood sugar rises, but we can produce more insulin. So we just produce more and more and more. And then the blood sugar is normalized and I don't have diabetes. It's fine. But the issue is that the insulin now is really high and we can only keep that up for so long. Eventually the uh, pancreas kind of burns out and we can't supply that high level of insulin anymore and that when that at that point when that happens it starts you start to see pre-diabetes and, and then it transitions to diabetes but again these things i'm not trying to scare you we're going to be addressing how to work with this and how to do our job to prevent or delay another type of diabetes is gestational diabetes this is a smaller much smaller percentage and of pregnancies 2 to 10% of pregnancies um, it's where you see it where you see this happen and gestational diabetes means you know when you're when you're pregnant the placenta releases hormones that force your body to need more insulin right we're back to now we need more insulin 
And if, because of genetics, we can't produce that high level of insulin, then you have the resulting uh, high blood sugar during pregnancy called uh, gestational diabetes. When folks are pregnant, they get screened right away and they can check if you're coming in to the pregnancy as a person with diabetes or if you have diabetes already because of the pregnancy, typically it doesn't develop until much later. So the normal screening is about uh, weeks 24 to 28. You go into a visit and they have a special test where you drink this really sugary uh, water. Think of it as an extra strength tang, really sweet, not pleasant, 50 grams of sugar. You drink it, uh, well, you take your blood sugar first, you drink it, then they check your blood sugar again in an hour increment and then two hour increment. And there's certain parameters there for detecting. Uh, somebody had asked before the presentation, uh, I think Ted sent in by, by email, I think during the registration, if uh, how is this diabetes treated? Is it the same, is it treated the same as type two diabetes? And uh, not necessarily, some similarities. The difference here is that if we're talking about uh, blood sugar crossing the placenta, we don't want to overload that baby with high blood sugar. The baby can have a lot of problems and grow too big and can also become, it's already going to be at risk for diabetes, but we have to do everything possible to keep that blood sugar as normal as possible during the, the pregnancy. And so 24 to 28 weeks, so 24 weeks, 40, 40 week pregnancy. So you're looking at about four months of intense diabetes management with injected insulin being the, if, let me back up a little bit, uh, diet and nutrition, if that can work and still promote some healthy weight gain because there is an, a needed weight gain for pregnancy. If that's style of eating can control blood sugar, then good. But otherwise the gold standard is, is insulin injection. Now, which is newer than when I was trained, uh, oral medications are uh, now being allowed to, for this management of gestational diabetes. So oral medications, we can think even metformin, for example. Now we know that does cross, cross, cross the placenta, but I understand that those can still be used. Now I do have some definite limitations discussing medications since I'm not a pharmacist or, or MD. So I do wanna let the group know. I can talk a little bit more about medications, but not very much. So diabetes, risk factors. What are the risk factors for developing diabetes? And uh, a couple of them, if uh, number one, let's see here, not in any particular order, but uh, uh, being pre-diabetic, that puts you at risk. Between 15 and 30% of folks with pre-diabetes do develop diabetes within, within the next five years, and some can, can prevent it. Um, but again, we're gonna work on that today. Uh, if we're overweight, puts us at risk. If you're 45 years or older, they check to see if you have diabetes or prediabetes, just age alone. Uh, if you have a parent or brother or sister with type two diabetes. Good. I see questions pouring in, which is really good. I can't read, the, I can't see your questions, but uh, Twin is helping to um, keep track of those questions. So absolutely feel free, this is, going to be good. It's going to be for a nice Q&A at the end. Other factors for diabetes um, are um, being physically active less than three times per week. If you have had gestational diabetes or given birth to a baby with nine pounds or more, right? my understanding with gestational diabetes, about 50% of folks with gestational diabetes ultimately develop type 2 diabetes. Are if you're also, if you're African-American, Hispanic, Latino, American, American Indian, Alaska Native, Native uh, Pacific Islander, and Asian Americans are also at higher risk for diabetes. And just to go back a little bit, remember genetics is a very, very big part of this. You might have the genetics, but how do you turn on that, that trigger? How do you trigger it to become pre-diabetes and diabetes? And, 
we'll talk about that. Um, oftentimes lifestyle can, it most typically turns on that switch. What are the signs and symptoms? Let me just to, to be a little bit, before I address these signs and symptoms, from, just from experience and just from reading about more of this, the, you know, you see these type of signs and symptoms when blood sugar is quite elevated. Uh, you know, normal blood sugar is fasting is 100 and 140 or less, uh, you know, after eating meals. But when these symptoms develop, when blood sugars are quite high, I've heard folks tell me when, they, when they're in two or 300 blood sugar readings, you get this blurry vision or you feel hungry all the time because the blood, it's the sugar staying in the blood instead of being delivered to the cells because there isn't sufficient insulin there to allow the sugar to go into the cells. Hungry all the time, I just ate and I'm hungry again. Feeling thirsty all the time, that's related to urinating all the time. You're actually peeing out sugar because you have sugar so high in the blood, you pee it out and the urination, frequent urination leads to frequent thirst. Losing weight, back to keeping the food, food in the blood, not delivering it to the cells. And I definitely have seen this where oh, very overweight folks uh, develop diabetes, they don't know they have it. And th what has prompted them to seek medical attention is all of a sudden they're getting really thin and they're like, what happened? I'm not dieting. I'm eating the same actually. And you'll see the significant weight loss. Poor, wean, poor wound healing. Remember those tiny vessels, the really tiny ones, they're called capillaries. They deliver oxygen to that skin up there. And you know, if we can't get oxygen there, how can we heal or nutrients or protein, we can't deliver that to the cells at the, on the skin. So you can see how that wound would take a while to heal. We're tired all the time. The blood's full of sugar. Instead of being in the cells, cells are starving and we just don't feel so good. Literally the blood would be really thick and sluggish too. So we feel thick and sluggish, like our battery is low. Numbness or tingling, tingling in the hands. This is called neuropathy damage to the nerves from the high blood sugar, again, likely to essentially not getting oxygen to those particular extremity nerves, irritating them, and feeling a nausea and vomiting. Again, this is a kind of a more classic when you see someone who has overt type two diabetes who has not been diagnosed and who maybe hasn't been to the doctor for a long time and they see this. He said, I don't know what's going on. And uncontrolled diabetes, how does it damage? So if we have diabetes and we're not on our medications or following our eating plan or exercise and not controlling that blood sugar, how do we, uh, what are the, the, what's the damage? And the eyes, uh, diabetes is the number one cause of blindness in this country. I actually work one day a week at, it's called the Lion's Eye Foundation Clinic. And where I see folks um, who um, have significant eye damage and are getting laser treatment and various eye injections. Um, yes, needle in the eye. I've seen that. And uh, these injections to treat these conditions caused by um, too much sugar and not enough oxygen to the eye. So there's the names there. I won't read them. I mean, Retinopathy, you can think of most, most people sometimes call it a diabetic eye disease. Heart disease, coronary heart disease. Uh, it's very well established that high blood sugar irritates the arteries and causes damage to the arteries and the heart. And that's why we want to control that blood sugar and keep it as normal as possible. Keeping it normal really is, I'd, I say, you know, it's almost like not having diabetes when the blood sugar is, is just the right level even though we have diabetes, blood sugar is controlled, then we don't have to um, overload our organs with too much sugar. Kidney disease, uh, kidney failure and the need for dialysis, this number one cause in this country is uh, diabetes. So you have folks in the um, receiving dialysis three times a week to clean out their blood. The kidneys are that organ that filters your blood, removes the waste products and sends them to the bladder and you can pee them out. And that uh, urination of the toxic of the toxins is, is good. 
with damaged kidneys, it's like having a clogged filter and that clogged filter doesn't allow your kidney to filter and clean the blood. If it gets too damaged, then we need a machine to clean and filter your blood. And that's what's called dialysis. Uh, nerves. So we talked about neuropathy, damaging the nerves, too much sugar and the teeth, um, tooth decay. Uh, again, those are tiny vessels there that need to supply the, the, the surrounding teeth and, issue, and tissues there with oxygen. And there is a lot of irritation there from the high blood sugar. The brain um, damaging vessels. So we do have uh, typically stroke uh, can happen. But again, all these things are once a person is diagnosed with diabetes, it's the reason why a lot of folks are put on uh, cholesterol medication, like a statin, for example, and they're put on blood pressure medicine to help with the kidneys and the heart. And they're put on, on, on oral pills to control the blood sugar. Um, if the blood sugar, there's a point there, if the oral pills are no longer working and there's so many variety of, of medications and they work in so many different fashions, but there's a point there where if the uh, oral pills are not working, then they transition to a daily injection, one daily injection of insulin. And ultimately, if that doesn't work, then they go to multiple injections of different types of insulin. So all does sound quite scary, but again, we're gonna look at what we can do, what's in our power. Prediabetes, how many people have prediabetes? So uh, this is quite remarkable, 84.1 million. Um, that is uh, one out of three adults have prediabetes, which really mimics how many, what's the obesity rate in this country is it's one out of three. So one out of three folks are not, there's a category of overweight and there's a category of obesity in the category of obesity. It's uh, one out of three, but uh, some of these folks are actually not obese. They're overweight and maybe only have 20, 30 pounds extra. And uh, they're already, they're pre-diabetic because of their genetics. And so we, with genetics, they have a lower threshold for handling weight where somebody who does not have genetics for, for diabetes can gain a lot more weight without having diabetes. They may have other symptoms or not other symptoms, but other conditions, but not develop diabetes, even though they may be 50, 100 pounds overweight, they still will not have diabetes because they can produce enough insulin. They have that genetics. Uh, obviously, there's other, other issues there, heart issues and things like that, and blood pressure issues and kidney issues. Nine out of 10 people with prediabetes don't know they have it. And I'm going to teach you today how to know if you are pre-diabetic or anybody you know is pre-diabetic. Diabetes, uh, 29 million. And uh, in this case, one out of four folks who have overt diabetes are not aware that they have diabetes. And again, we'll show you how to identify that. Uh, looking at a public health issue, I did work at the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and uh, I wanted to show you these slides uh, starting back for 1994 and then jumping every two years. What you're going to see is as the darker, as the color gets darker, that means the incidence of uh, the prevalence, I mean, of, of diabetes gets um, higher. So you can see this is a long time ago. Can you see the color changes? It's quite dramatic. So it's so dramatic. In 2011, they, they, they really needed to refine the surveys, make sure this is really happening. It's hard to believe. So they included uh, now with cell phones, they can gather more data and make sure these are right. And what they found was actually worse. So the number, the rates are just dramatic. They're increasing really quickly and they're mirroring our obesity and overweight rates. That's kind of a, a short summary. So you can see that this is an epidemic and this is a public health issue. And it's one that I think we can, we can tackle. We just need to uh, come up with a good plan. And I think we can do that today. A lot of people say, why is this happening? Well, our society has changed quite a bit. Um, portion sizes, there is a real term now called portion distortion. 
where, uh, you know, cheapest cost of a restaurant, the lowest, the overhead cost of a restaurant is the food itself, you know, paying employees and paying the rent and insurance and a number of other issues is expensive, but paying for um, the food itself, the raw ingredients is not that much. Give them twice as much food, they'll come back. And that's exactly what happened. And the next restaurant had to do the same to compete and created a culture where we have norms now um, that have led us to expect very large portions. See that, twice as much calories. Now, can we eat all of this food? Yes, we can. We have a very flaccid stomach that once we eat, like a balloon can stretch. We got about 20 minutes before you get that signal to the brain that you're full. So we got time to consume it. What is that? So glucose comes from the foods you eat. Let me get a bigger picture of this. So glucose, um, this is the sugar, right? We're going to digest sugar. Sugar comes in different forms. And I'm not saying that these uh, junk food up here is by any means uh, comparable to the fruit. The only difference is well, there's a lot of differences here. This, so this one has a lot of extra sugar and fats and artificial this and that. Um, this one is mostly water, fiber, and amazing nutrients. Now, they both do have one ingredient there in common called sugar, uh, sucrose, if you will. And it is digested uh, through enzymes that live on your intestines. You don't need help from a powerful pancreas. You can just break them apart there. Uh, however, uh, this glucose goes right into the bloodstream, but this fructose, it needs to be go to the liver to be converted into glucose. The only way you're gonna transport sugar in your blood is in the form of glucose. So this fructose technically is, is uh, needs to be converted. Too much fructose, and we overload the liver and now we turn it into fat and that irritates the arteries. And it's the reason why too much sugar is not good for the heart because too much sugar uh, can um, be turned into these called fatty acids that as they travel through the arteries, irritate the arteries. Now, what about high fructose corn syrup? This is unbelievable. Do you have a corn with a, pure glucose, chains of glucose. And in this laboratory, they were able to create it, create a new molecule, fructose and glucose. Incredible, huh? We were thinking, obviously, this has got to be bad for you. But it turned out the, the body couldn't distinguish this sugar from regular white sugar or from sugar and fruit. And so... Uh, it's a really cheap way to make sugar, cheaper than a uh, sugar cane or sugar beets. Uh, so it's, um, you see it in soda and candy and drinks. And again, so we have back to the glucose. Now, the issue there, it's everywhere. I mean, look at this, even the bear got to hold us from high fructose corn syrup. So it's so cheap, they can just add it to everything. Uh, what about sugar in milk? Have you bought a yogurt and you say, wow, this is a lot of sugar in this yogurt. Some of that or a lot of that can be lactose. Now, this is a different sugar. It's called lactose. We have glucose. Okay, that's our friend. And galactose. So kind of like the sucrose, the galactose goes to the liver and gets converted into, into glucose. Anybody lactose intolerant? I can't see you, but... I'm sure there's people nodding their heads. Uh, lactose intolerance means that the enzyme that lives on the intestinal wall, on the inside of that intestine that breaks apart this glucose and galactose is not there anymore. And that's normal. I think some folks just over years, they, they lose that enzyme. It's not from the pancreas. So nothing wrong with your pancreas. It's just that it lives on the intestine. Now, the only way you can absorb sugar into your bloodstream is in this form of a, it's called a mono monosaccharide, an individual piece of sugar. If you have two of them joined together, you can't absorb that through the wall of the intestine. So this is going to travel 20 feet of small intestine 
and then get into the five feet of the colon and the bacteria in the colon are gonna have a party. They're gonna love this. They're gonna eat this up, produce a lot of gas. Maybe as it goes in, draw some water. So we can have some loose stool, gassiness, abdominal discomfort. But if you take a lactase enzyme pill, you can break it up. It'll mix in there in your stomach before it's released to the small intestine and it can get digested by this external little pill. It's kind of what they did with lactose-free milk, the lactate, it's just regular cow milk, but they were able to add the enzyme to the milk and break it apart. So, so yes, you can have some, some if you're lactose intolerant, you, those are some strategies. Uh, starch, back to starch. So the sugar is gonna go into the bloodstream. Uh, what about all this amazing food here? Uh, well, some of it amazing. Like the beans are amazing. The uh, this quinoa and brown rice and all these whole grains, awesome. Um, maybe not so great. The baguette, that's refined flour, and this white rice over here, not so great. But all of it will have glucose, and does those long chains get digested and enter your blood in the form of sugar? See, just break them up. Individual glucose units, uh, molecules there can enter your bloodstream. Okay, here we go. Now it's getting good. So insulin, back to the insulin. Insulin is that hormone that opens the cell like a key so that the sugar that's in your blood can go into the cell. Can you see that key? That's your insulin, right? So usually we have sugar in the blood and we just produce insulin and it opens the, the door it, and the insulin goes into the cell. Now it goes into the cell. We either burn that for fuel or we store this fat. So burn it or store it. But at least it's not in the blood anymore. At least the blood sugar normal is normalized, right? So that's how insulin works. Now with type one diabetes, we mentioned there is no insulin and without insulin, you will, you will die. So this is a, a necessity for folks with type one diabetes and they have these in, uh, injections um, where they come in the form of a pen or, or nowadays you have what's an insulin pump. And this pump, you can, um, based on what you eat, you can, you can deliver the appropriate amount of insulin to match the, the carbs that you're eating. So somebody with type one diabetes doesn't have to go on a low carb diet. They can eat carbs that they want, that they need, but they have to be able to give themselves the right amount of insulin to match it so that the blood sugar is controlled. There is a, a something in the middle they call type 1.5. This is a kind of a new thing that's being discovered that this autoimmune diabetes in adults where latent autoimmune diabetes in adults uh, called LATA, where in few cases they're noticing that adults are out, um, destroying their own pan pancreatic cells because of an autoimmune condition. So you think of kind of like rheumatoid arthritis, right? Your own body is attacking your joints. Um, it's, yeah, so this is a newer thing, not very common, but this is something. Okay, back to the insulin. So you see here the key, this is your insulin, this is your cell, we're opening it up. Now here is what causes type two diabetes. It's insulin resistance. So insulin resistance is what we have the genetics for. So if you're genetically predisposed to be insulin resistant, that means that with any, with weight gain and a number of other factors that we'll talk about, uh, we turn on the switch so that the cells, this is a cell right here, this whole thing is a cell, becomes resistant to the, to the insulin. It's almost like the key hole is kind of jammed. And now the key can't go in and open the door. Well, we just produce more insulin and more insulin and more insulin until we can finally remove all this excess sugar here. But if we can't, uh, well, let me back up a little bit, but that is the role of insulin. And we, when there's this resistance, insulin can't do its job. And we, we usually produce more until, until we, we burn out the pancreas. So here we go. Uh, back to the insulin. So insulin does other things than just remove the sugar from the blood and put it into your cells. It is a growth hormone. It is needed for 
growth of the body, the muscles, and to make fat. If this hormone is ne needed to make fat, um, and we have a lot of this hormone, it's gonna do, it's not gonna allow you to burn fat. So a lot of folks have insulin resistance and the doctor says, oh, you just gotta lose weight. But they have such a high level of insulin in their blood that that insulin is making it hard to lose weight. It wants to turn everything into fat. It also makes you very hungry. And so there are some ways around that. But again, it's good to know that, you know, we can't just blame the patient all the time. Oh, they're overweight, they're, they're pre-diabetic, and they don't want to lose weight. No, they do. Everybody does if they need to. And the insulin levels can be measured. I don't know how many doctors are doing that, but you can check a fasting insulin level. And when it's high, you say, wow, okay, that's why I'm having a hard time losing weight. And that's, I'm going to be heading towards prediabetes or, or diabetes. Usually by the time folks are pre-diabetic, we already know this is kind of a mute point, mute point. It's already, okay, we know you're insulin resistant. Just let's, let's see what we can do with diet and lifestyle. Risk factors, we talked about genetic susceptibility, uh, predisposition, extra calories, extra carbs. So if you add extra calories and carbs, gain weight, eating the wrong foods, too much carbohydrate, you're gonna put a higher demand. Every carb that you consume requires more insulin. And so the more carbs, the more insulin, and there's a point there where we exceed the amount of insulin that we can make when we get the symptoms. But again, typically that cycle, blood glucose rises, more insulin released, and then glucose is stored as fat. The more fat we gain, the more resistant we become, become to insulin, and it becomes a cycle. So there's an estimate about 25% of, of Americans have insulin resistance. You kind of you can see that that it's, it's you know quite a, quite an issue. But again, we'll get to what we can do about it. Uh, type two diabetes. I'm checking my clock here. We got some time here, uh, and we did mention this already. It's again, when we cannot produce enough, when we're producing half the the the, the insulin, then you know, it's hard to manage the sugar that's coming into the body in the form of glucose, whether it comes from healthy food or not healthy food. Of course, healthy food is way better, but uh, there's going to be that demand for producing or needing more insulin. If we can do things that so that our body needs less insulin, that's good. Remember, if we can do things so that our body needs less insulin, and maybe we can meet it halfway. If it only produces 50% amount of insulin compared to before, but we do things that make our body need less insulin, eating the right foods, exercising, losing weight, then maybe it all just will match perfectly and, and we're, we can delay this or prevent it. I hope I don't get it. Now, hope is an action, right? So hope is you have to act. We don't, just automatically things happen, fall into place. So there's, there are signs and symptoms of insulin resistance. And if you manage those, you can delay or prevent type two diabetes. Those symptoms are here. Um, if you have three of the five symptoms below, there's a condition called metabolic syndrome essentially is linked to being insulin resistant. It's kind of just saying, it's another way to identify a person with insulin resistance is if they have metabolic syndrome, which would be three of these. If you check off on three of these, then, then that would be um, important to, to modify um, the diet and the lifestyle. So let's look at this here. Um, uh, number one, one of them in no particular order is a waist circumference of more than 35 inches for women and more than 40 inches for men. Don't worry, this is not the pant size. We're not talking about pant size. We're talking about something else. And we're, I'm going to show you a picture so that you can ident so you can know what this means. If the fasting blood sugar is over 100, um, some folks say 110, under 100 is, is normal. So higher than that means that 
we're not producing enough insulin just to deal with our normal needs. I mean, here's a situation where you're not eating for more than 10 hours for a fasting blood sugar. And if it's high, so hmm, that shouldn't be the case, right? Uh, blood pressure, if that's elevated, blood pressure is, a sim it is, is high when insulin is high also. Triglycerides, um, remember triglyceride is fat. So at the high, if you have a high fat level in your blood, it's likely that the insulin level is also high causing the, that fat um, number, those numbers to go up. And low HDL, HDL is the healthy cholesterol. And uh, for women, it should, you know, if it's anything below 50 and for men below 40, that would be a sign of insulin resistance. So again, any of these five, three of these five, you would, could, the doctor could write on your medical record, metabolic syndrome. And then um, it's just a, I guess you could say, a call to action. Here's what I mean by the waist circumference. If you look at, um, and you might wanna try this at home, is to find the top of your hip bone, right here, this hip bone, it's called the iliac. And you can, Touch the side of your, on your side and find your ribs and then go below your ribs and you're going to find kind of a soft area. Uh, and then you'll bump into the top of your hip bone. Can you, can you find the top of your hip bone? Poke your sides, got the ribs, then it's a little blank area there, a little, little cushy valley. And then we get to the top of the hip bone. That's where you put the measuring tape on that spot. You might even want to put a, a little piece of tape on there. Or, and then you got your measuring tape and you measure parallel to the floor. See, here's the line, parallel to the floor. So you can see that the largest girth can now be measured. You can wear your pants like this. See, we can wear a smaller pant size like this. But if you measure right across, at the top of that hip bone, you're gonna get the largest area of the abdomen. If it's more than 35 inches for women and more than 40 inches for men, that's, that means it's high. And why is that a problem? And you've heard it many times, you know, it's where you store the fat that matters. And uh, the fat inside that we're concerned with is called visceral fat. This fat is deep within, deep within. It's on top of the liver on top of your organs, your intestines. You can't touch it. It's not the one on the outside that we can pinch. People say, oh, I got these folds of fat here. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's subcutaneous fat. Uh, not very active and that's okay. I mean, it's just the other, but the problem is this visceral fat in here acts like an organ itself and starts to cause a lot of malfunction and it starts to release molecules that cause inflammation and it makes insulin resistance even worse. It turns on that switch, that genetic switch we have for many problems and for even problems we don't have genetics for or, or that are not proven to be genetic, but even, even cancer, because I do see a lot of cancer patients and this causes inflammation, which in, can interfere with the replication of cells when all our cells have a certain lifespan and they need to be re replaced. And when they're replaced, if there's an error there, it can develop into um, a disease. So this is the fat we want to get rid of, visceral fat. Luckily, there are some good news here. Seems like I'm the bad news guy. I don't mean to be saying bad news, but this is good news. The good news is that we don't need to lose all this weight that we may have gained over the course of our life. You know, from people say, I, I weigh 40, 50 pounds more than I did when I was in high school or college. I need to lose 50 pounds. And I'm thinking, no, you don't need to lose, lose 50 pounds. You need to lose around 7 to 10% of your current weight. Because, so you have, let's say you're 200 pounds. 20 10%, that'd be about getting down to 180. Say, and say, no, Eric, I used to weigh 150. I want to go to 150. Well, all we need to do is get to that 180, that 10%. And you know why? Because it's that 
first fat that we're losing comes from the visceral fat, right? This visceral fat right here, right? This visceral fat, I also call it uh, hibernation fat, hibernating fat. This is the one that's supposed to grow and shrink, grow in the, in the summer and shrinks in the winter because there's no food in the winter. I mean, I mean, now we have food everywhere, right? But uh, hunting and gathering, this was saved our life. But now it stays big for a prolonged period of time and causes disruption, significant disruption. It's not meant to be big all the time. It's supposed to go away. So when we lose weight initially, it comes off that visceral fat and then things get way better. Blood sugar drops, blood pressure drops, cholesterol drops, everything gets better. So a little bit of weight loss goes a very long way. And you can tell it's working because the waist circumference measurement gets smaller, right? And people make the mistake of wanting to lose 50 pounds and then they get fed up because there's a the point there where we plateau. Now the body's designed for survival. The body does not like losing weight. It'll let you lose weight to a certain point. And so with diet and exercise, unfortunately, the only really proven success is about 10%. And usually that's enough to improve all the health conditions, conditions so that, that works. But, um, but for more major weight loss, then, then bariatric surgery is, is the way to go. If you need to lose 100 pounds and you want to lose 100 pounds, then that's bariatric surgery. In particular, it's called the sleeve gastrectomy. No more of this bypass surgery because that was not very safe. But that had a lot of problems. I mean, it's safe, but it, it had issues. And it was good when it was being done because that's what we had. And it was curing, it did cure diabetes for folks that bypass surgery. But now there's a much, much better one. And that's called a sleeve gastrectomy. And that does cure diabetes. Okay, so back to the back to weight loss, time is moving quick here. And just for a reminder, our body needs gasoline, it needs food and needs fuel. But it can get fuel from three main areas from food, obviously, right? You can also use body fat for fuel. You can burn fat to keep your body going. And if we try to lose weight too quickly, more than let's say, well, more than two pounds per week, I mean, that's still quite a bit, that's a lot. Um, then we start to burn muscle for fuel. Can't keep burning fat that quickly. So I tell folks two pounds of weight loss per month, 10 months, that's 20 pounds, even, and we protect our muscle that way. Remember, muscle is very important. That's your, this is your fountain of youth, your muscle. This is what keeps you being able to function and be strong and stay balanced and do all those activities and not be fatigued is muscle. So we don't wanna lose muscle in the process of trying to lose weight. So slow, losing it slow is good. Two to four pounds a month, that's it. Uh, there are some approaches that are promising now. Uh, intermittent fasting. You might have heard of this intermittent fasting. This is where we use the sleep time to help with a prolonged fast. So let's say people will eat um, for a eight-hour period and 16 hours of no food. So, for example, 10 a.m. breakfast, and then you have your lunch, and then 6 p.m. dinner, and nothing after 6 p.m. until the next day at 10 o'clock. And then that gives you, if I'm correct, is that right? Six and six. Yeah, I think that does, that does work. So 15 hours works, 14 hours works too. So let's try a different one. Let's say, uh, let's say somebody eats dinner at 7 p.m. So 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. is 12 hours. Let's add two more to that. So let's see, seven, eight, nine, 10 to 10. Okay. 7 p.m. dinner, 10 a.m. breakfast. That gives you about 15 hour fast. Still pretty good. And so for some people that say, oh, you know, and they get really into it and they say, well, I can't believe it. I, I, I don't wake up hungry. I feel fine. I'm more energetic. I'm losing fat. And they're losing fat because by not, by going a prolonged period of time, they give themselves a break from releasing insulin. Every time you eat, you release insulin, right? And so if we suppress your insulin levels, remember insulin likes to turn food into fat, turn things into fat, in too much insulin prevents fat, fat breakdown. 
But when you go this fasting period this long, you can actually start to release fat for fuel. So look into this one. This is interesting. Uh, mindless eating, any distractions, of course, is, we don't realize it and the bowl is gone. So we have to kind of stay away from mindless eating so we can control that blood sugar. Control the risk awareness, uh, you know, mindfulness. Uh, are, you, are you sitting while you're eating? Are you eating slow? Are you munching quickly? Are you eating, you know, do we need to put the fork down between bites like they do in Weight Watchers? That works. Um, so am I stressed? Am I bored? Am I really hungry? Is, you know, so it's good to have a schedule to eat. Um, all calories count. I'm not saying don't drink alcohol, but alcohol has to be converted into fat because it's a, it used to be a carb. And then a, instead of a carb, it's now turned into a whole new molecule called alcohol. And then that goes to your liver and you burn it for fuel. So I tell people, if you're going to have some wine with dinner, then you got to compensate for those calories. You got to remove, add more vegetables and maybe less starch and smaller portion of the protein and you can have your wine. Uh, cravings, cravings come, uh, the fat and the sugar, when you consume those, you release uh, in the brain a substance called dopamine and dopamine is very soothing, although it's very temporary. And so we can kind of get a little, it can be a go-to for stress relief, right? Uh, so overcoming cravings, how do we do that? Let's see, Eric, we're home, it's COVID. How are we supposed to, to not eat when it's right there? I have a lot of folks who say, oh, well, I don't keep it at home. Um, but, but what we could do is just have an eating schedule. If you actually have it on the calendar, on your refrigerator, a schedule of when, you're, when your eating times are and uh, kind, of average, kind of when your snack times are, if it's not eating time, you know, it takes three or four hours for your stomach to empty. If it's not eating time, then you find and distract yourself with something else, you know, or you ask yourself, am I really hungry? Is this stress, lon loneliness, boredom, habit? What is it? If you're not hungry, you distract yourself, call a friend, take a walk, sort through some files or organize a closet, get some stuff out for goodwill, clean it all out, and then put some music on. And before you know it, it will be time to eat on your schedule. It's, oh, wow, well, I was craving something. Now it's actually time to eat. I'll eat my food and or I'll eat a little, little bit less and have some dessert, but I'm going to have, be careful with the portion of dessert. I don't want to get too much carb. And of course we are human. So don't restrain yourself too much. So we don't want to end up binging or deprived. Uh, does take 20 minutes for the food to reach your small intestine and send the message to your brain that you're full 20 minutes. So that's a long time, right? Body is smart. It's trying to get us to gain fat. Give us a lot of time to eat before we have the signal that says, oh, I'm not feeling. It's like when you have a, we used to do, when we were going to restaurants, to get an appetizer. And then by the time the food came, 20 minutes later, 20 minutes later, I are not so interested in eating anymore. It wasn't the same, that same, because you've kind of turned off that signal. But of course, we can override it and still eat. Uh, keeping a diary, uh, what you eat can help keep the pounds off. Sometimes just not being aware of what we're eating. And this is all supported by some studies. Just writing it all down, being honest. And some of this might be embarrassing to write or just painful to write. Oh, I can't believe I ate that. I'm going to write it down. But just keeping track every day, every little thing that we eat, even on the paper, without even counting calories, you don't even have to count the calories. Just the fact that you're being aware of your quantity, your portion, the frequency. You write down the time, you write down what you ate and how much, and that starts to make you more aware. That alone has helped people lose weight. So all of that was, all of that discussion, huge discussion was on what we can do if the waist circumference is above 35 for women and more than 40 for men. The next one on the list is glucose. And this is a really important one. I know, uh, I have about 10 more minutes to talk because I want to leave time for questions. And it'll move pretty quick after we get this section. But this is another one of the long sections. And this is really important is how do you know you have diabetes or prediabetes? In your yearly checkup, or you can call and have a checkup, get, to get blood work and get this found out right now. Not, I wouldn't say right now, but you know, this week or next week is 
this test called the A1C test. The doctor knows what you're talking about exactly. You just you, primary doctor, hey, I want to get an A1C test. Or what was, what was my last A1C test? Because some of these doctors are used to seeing people with diabetes and you might be in the pre-diabetic range, but they're like, ah, oh, you're doing pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. You're doing pretty good compared to somebody with diabetes. But I don't want to be with a person with diabetes. So I say, no, doctor, I need to know, am I in the pre-diabetic range? And now I do know what it is. Am I between 5.7 and 6.4%? What's my number, doctor? And then you will know. You want it below 5.7%. So A1C test, one you want to look up, one you want to think about, one you want to ask for. The fasting blood sugar is more common because you'll do a what they call metabolic panel, which has a number of labs to check your kidneys and to check uh, your liver and to check your pancreas. There's it's kind of standard tests. So this is a one shot deal. This is um, um, kind of a snapshot of your blood sugar in a fasting state should be under 100. If it's above 126 fasting, then that's diabetes. 100 to 125 is normal. This last one here, glucose tolerance test, uh, not really common. This is one of those where you drink the sugary drink and they check your blood sugar over a two hour period. So not as common that one. But back to the A1C test, uh, back to that one. Um, this A1C test measures, what does it measure? It measures, it gives, it, what it's really measuring is how much sugar has stuck to your red blood cells. And from that number, they can extrapolate, they can pull from there an average blood sugar for the past three months. So you get your blood sugar, you get your A1C tomorrow, and you'll know what your blood sugar was pretty much the past three months. So October, well, August, September, October, around there. Does that make sense? Hopefully, I can't see anybody. I'm just talking to a computer here. So, I, uh, okay. For people who do have diabetes, if you have diabetes, knowing your A1C is real critical to know if your diet and your medication are working. So let's say you're taking uh, oral pills like metformin, which does a lot of things. It, we can talk more if people, people really wanna know what that is. Um, it's the number one, it's the first line medication you get if you have diabetes or even pre-diabetes. It just calms your liver down from releasing sugar because you're liver is pumping out sugar. And when you have diabetes or pre-diabetes, it kind of malfunctions and over secretes sugar. Uh, and then that on top of the insulin resistance and it all comes together. But for a person with diabetes, you want, um, if you're on insulin below 7%, uh, not too far below seven, you want it about seven if you have insulin, because you don't want to take a chance of going too low. Low is more dangerous. If you're not on insulin, you can get down here at this level. Um, person with uh, taking all their medication, eating a very low carb diet, eating right, and they're taking all their pills, and the blood sugar just keeps rising, this A1C keeps going up and up and up, then, then the doctor knows it's time for insulin. And insulin is usually started with one single injection. It's a 24 hour in injection. It lasts, you inject at night, and it lasts the whole course of the day. And you still keep some oral medications and follow your diet. And usually that helps uh, dramatically, and that improves blood sugars quite a bit. Uh, I tell people, don't be afraid of insulin. It's, it's not like medication. This is just a supplement. You're supplementing what your body's not producing. It's you're, produ you're supplementing the hormone that's missing that's causing diabetes of lack of insulin. So here you're, you're giving your body insulin. So don't be afraid. You know, it is, especially the first insulins they use are very mild, uh, but they work really good. In more severe cases, you need two different types of insulins one at night and then one with each meal. And it's, there's so many combinations of this and it really is extremely complicated, something for a doctor or a, a pharmacist. Now talking about what turns into sugar, not everything turns into sugar. See, if you look at this plate, uh, everything on the left, or I, I don't know if it's your left, but everything on this 50% of the plate here, this green part over here, even the carrots have minimal sugar. Yes, they're so sweet. I must be lying, no. Uh, these are what's called non-starchy vegetables. A cup of carrots has about five grams of carbs. A cup of rice or a cup of pasta has 45 grams of carbs. It's a big difference. So we don't worry too much about these vegetables. So non-starchy vegetables, go for it. 
this really should fill up your stomach and some protein and you're good to go and a little bit of carb, 25% of your plate, just a little bit of carb. This is your potatoes, your rice, your pasta, your beans, tortillas. Um, so you can see it's not that much. What about good carbs versus bad carbs? People say that complex versus simple. Yes, the complex carbs have fiber. They're incredibly great for your arteries. They help with preventing heart disease and they are absorbed slower. They might have the same amount of carbs, but they are absorbed slower, which actually gives your body time to work with that. So those are better. This I wanted to explain briefly is a system called uh, diabetic exchange exchanges, or you might call it carbohydrate counting. When um, CHO stands for carbs. So people say, well, I can't eat bananas. They're bad for me. Um, yeah, I guess I can see why. Four inches of banana would have the same amount of sugar as a whole apple. 15 grams of sugar. Everything here is divided into 15 grams of sugar. How much can I eat to provide myself with 15 grams of sugar or carbs? At one meal, we don't want to eat more than 45 grams of carbs. So it gives you some, some ways to keep track. Remember your protein, your chicken, your fish, your eggs have, don't, don't have carbs. The healthy fats, the avocado, peanuts, and olive oil, there's no fats there. I mean, there's no carbs. Your non-starchy vegetables, really no carbs. So we're mainly looking at these carbs. And if you look at pasta and rice, just a third cup of this, I mean, maybe for a toddler, this is tiny, is 15 grams of carbs. So you can see how we can completely throw our, cell, our carb intake uh, into the red zone just by eating these foods. So not the best. So we really take it easy on those. Here's an alternative. Instead of 45 grams of carbs, we did this uh, zucchini with a spiralizer for eight grams of carbs. You can still put your sauce and your turkey on there, ground turkey, and it tastes delicious. And this person even had a little bit of wine. So that works. You know, it's going with the non- starchy vegetables. You want to look that up, non-starchy vegetables. Here's the spiralizer you can get at Bed Bath & Beyond. They're great. You can turn anything into spaghetti or into uh, just a fun thing to eat. And without carbs, really, minimal, minimal carbs. I won't go into that too much more. We talked about carbs. Uh, here's the plate for, uh, you can see how where the carbs are. Not a lot of carbs here, just the beans and the, and the corn. The rest of it is not carbs. Oh, I see twin pop in her head here. We're getting close to the questions. Um, yes, we are, but feel free to finish. All right, maybe enjoying we're enjoying your joke. <laughs> oh, okay, sounds good. We're getting really close, very close here. We uh, maybe give me five more minutes. Uh, for vegans, uh, this tracking of carbohydrate content or the counting carbs becomes really important because a lot of the foods are are relatively high in carbs. And, but you know, but look at this vegan dish. All of this has almost no carbs on the left, just the noodles. Of course, the noodles could have been whole grain, would have been better. Uh, here we go, just the garbanzos, not really too shabby. And this one, I don't even think I see a carb in there. I'm trying, this is edamame. Edamame is a little bit more unique than the other beans. It has minimal carbs. So yeah, so you can have this and then you can have a little tiny pastry there and then you're like, I don't know, I know that's not ideal, but you can have a, a small little dessert. Uh, sometimes just a matter of how you combine foods is important. If you're gonna have some carbs, make sure there's some healthy fats there with it. Uh, the banana, this is a little bit big, so that'd be probably too much, four inches banana. Greek yogurt with some berries, perfect. Here's some, uh, Carrots and some uh, celery with the hummus, that works. The other one is blood pressure. Uh, this is often controlled with a low sodium diet and with blood pressure medication. And you can see in weight loss too, when you lose weight, your blood pressure drops. And we talked about that weight loss. Most of the sodium does come from um, processed foods. Reading food labels, you're gonna see the total carbohydrate of that. Uh, that's what we really look at is the total carbohydrate. 
at one meal, we're really looking at less than 45 grams of carbs per meal. Uh, that does give you the sodium. So on a quick, quick note, anything more than 20% is high, 5% is low. So that applies to, and remember a twin can send these slides to you. So no need to scramble and try to write all this stuff down. Fresh is always better than processed. And if you can, you know, frozen oftentimes is extremely low. And if you buy the frozen vegetables and the frozen uh, fish and chicken, there's really no salt added there. Adding flavors is important. More flavor, more garlic. Uh, we're almost there. This is the triglycerides. When you check your blood triglycerides, this particular person had 36. Wow, it's really low. Um, more than 150, you can say I have a lot of blood, a lot of fat in my blood. Maybe there's too much insulin in your blood. HDL, remember, this is another one you want to check your level. It should be more than 50 for, me, for women and more than 50, 40 for men. And, and so that's the summary of the insulin resistance. And this is kind of what we, the bulk of the presentation. The rest of it was just talking about exercising and taking a chance to exercise. The stairs, not the escalator. Uh, find your exercises that bring joy to you, that you enjoy, put on that beanie and get out in the cold weather. Nothing can stop you. And you have your reasons. You know what your reasons are and why you want to do this. I know you can do it. If you commit to it, you commit, you put your mind to it, you can make these changes. Thank you. So the first question is, what's the difference between insulin injections and metformin pill intake? Slash uh, pill intake. Yeah, again, just the, the pills are the first line and, and usually the metformin is the first line approach. Uh, insulin, and this is for type two diabetes. So, um, so this is the insulin itself, again, is now when there's, for example, some pills that are like, it's called glipizide or glyburide that stimulate your pancreas to release more insulin. So this is another tool that doctors have. They have a pill that can help you uh, urinate, urinate more, more sugar. So that another way to lower blood sugar, there's a lot of different approaches, but when the pills are not working so well, then they go on to the insulin and insulin uh, is the real McCoy. It's the real thing. It's going to lower the blood sugar. It's going to do the job that the normal, the body does. You just, it's just a little more fine tuning is the, tr is the trick with it. And that takes a lot of practice. Thank you. The next question, what are good alternatives or healthier modifications to rice, dumplings and bread? Oh, that was that spiralizer with the non-starchy vegetables. Yes. Dumplings, I'm not too worried about because they come in usually like a broth. You can add a lot of vegetables to it. I can see how that'd be a pretty balanced uh, dish. All right. Now, next, would you manage would you manage gestational diabetes the same way you manage someone else's diabetes? Yep. I think we answered that one already. Yeah. A little yep. more aggressive, right. definitely more aggressively. Yeah. You you lower the blood sugar at all costs. Keep it keep it normal as temporary. Uh, now, you might have already touched on this next question as well, but the amount of food versus body size? Um, that's very individual. Uh, you, you know, that's a, yes, absolutely. So the more, the, the bigger you are, the more food your body can, can it wants to maintain that size. And it's also the bigger you are, the more insulin your body needs. So losing weight, the smaller you are, uh, then you need less insulin. And if your pancreas is only producing X amount of insulin, so lowering the weight helps you to need less insulin. But yeah, but literally um, the amount of calories does depend on your size. It's how much you know your muscle burns calories. So a simple equation, you kind of get an ideal body weight, not an ideal, but like a healthy body weight. If you know you're 10, 10 pounds over, 20 pounds over, you get that weight and you convert it into kilograms and you multiply it by 25 and that's your calories that your body needs, 25 calories per kilogram of healthy body weight. Not ideal, but healthy body weight. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. This next question has two parts to it by two different people, but the original one is, what causes cases of amputation in diabetic patients? Um, and then there's more a more specific question nested under that from someone else. Um, my father has sensitivity in his legs where he feels sharp pain when he moves. Doctors say it's due to diabetes. 
Um, he would like to know if this is a sign he could lose his leg. He controls his diabetes through some diet, but mostly medication. Um, yeah, oftentimes when there's damage to the, to the nerves and the foot, um, it's easy to damage the foot and not feel it. Even just wearing shoes that are too tight and causing a callus. Um, and you don't even know, you can step on a nail, you might not even know you stepped on it. So it's easy to get uh, infections. And because the blood sugar is high, it's hard to heal those infections. And very difficult to treat infections can get out of hand and can lead to gangrene and they have to am amputate to, pre to, pre to save your life. So they amputate, usually they'll start with the toe and if you need to amputate the foot, legs, things like that. But it's, again, these capillaries deliver blood and the blood should be really thin like water, which is what it normally is. So high blood sugar makes the blood sugar thick and sticky, more, more viscous. And so ultimately uh, controlling blood sugar uh, just because you have neuropathy and tingling feet and they say you have nerve damage, it just means you have to check your feet more often, really keep your feet dry, wear feet shoes that fit well, that give you space so they don't irritate. Never walk around barefoot and uh, just control your blood sugar and you can preserve that state so that you don't get infections and you don't need and it doesn't lead to problems. So no, you don't have to get amputation just because you have neuropathy. You got to keep a very close eye. Sometimes even the doctor will refer you to a podiatrist just so they can cut your nails correctly. Wow. All right. Thank you, Eric. Um, how can you relieve numbness to the hands? Uh, numbness, I don't know that answer. I don't know unless, again, if it was related, I'm thinking people sometimes say think tingling in the hands. That would be the neuropathy. Numbness, I guess, could also be a sign. But I think that might be a good question for a doctor. I don't know that one. The xylitol or aspartame raise blood sugar? Yes. Uh, no, these are art artificial sugars or even Splenda, which, which is called sucro sucralose. Uh, no, those, uh, those sugars are not quite getting, they're not getting into the blood in the form of glucose. So they're not triggering um, any response as you get from eating regular food. So American Diabetes Association has said it's safe to use these if you have diabetes. It's a good way to get that sweet flavor. I mean, I guess you could train your, your, your palate or train your tongue to want sweet flavors and crave sweetness. But uh, I think it's, if you're getting it this way through the artificial sweeteners, uh, that can work. I know there's a lot of... Uh, Controversy for some folks saying, no, it's just as bad. But, you know, just looking at, at studies and immediate response to your blood sugar, there is not a response to your high blood sugar or, or need for more insulin. So currently they're still, they are recommended. I think the less controversial ones are sucralose, which is called Splenda, and um, Stevia are the least. And xylitol is really good for the teeth. So those are the main ones. Thank you. Um, the next one, can you reverse type 2 diabetes? Can you reverse type 2 diabetes? Uh, well, once you have diabetes, you always have diabetes. But if you control the blood sugar to where it's normal, essentially, it's like you don't really have it. Um, now, if you did have that bariatric surgery, the sleeve gastrectomy, it's it's almost like curing it because you're off the medication right away and you're, for most cases, it's like curing it. The amount of food you can eat up after those surgeries is so small. I mean, you're lucky if you can get 600 calories in in one day, 600. So obviously you're under this, the observation of a doctor, you got to check in with your doctor, the surgeon, but yeah, those, but other than that, not really reverse it. We just, once it's type two, it's type two. In fact, I think what's, we gotta keep a close eye on it because it's a degenerative disease. And over time, the, like, again, I was saying, sometimes we eat perfectly and uh, the blood sugars are starting to rise. So that's why we have the A1C test to look at. And then that lets you and the doctor know if there needs to be a change in medication. 
or if insulin is needed. But again, you know, we, we do what we can and it's kind of like the cards that we're dealt with sometimes. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. So we have um, three more questions here. We're making great time. Um, next question. Could you reiterate the things one might experience if one might have diabetes? Uh, sure. Um, so the, the, the symptoms that you have, here's the thing about diabetes. It's, I still think of it as a silent disease because you can have high, higher blood sugar and be in the diabetes range and not know it because there's no symptoms until the blood sugar is relatively high. And so let's say your A1C is, um, well, let's see, 5.7, we said was, di was diabetes. You probably won't, 6.7, 6 6.7, 6 I mean, 6.5, 6.6, 6.7, 6 6.5, sorry, 6.5, 6.5 is diabetes. 6.5 and up is diabetes for A1C. It's going to be in a diabetic range, but it's going to be, you're not going to really know any symptoms there. You're not going to feel the symptoms. So to have high blood sugar and really high blood sugar, you're going to have symptoms of frequent urination because your body wants to, to urinate that sugar. That's going to lead to excess thirst and be really thirsty. So peeing a lot at night or being very thirsty all the time, uh, very hungry, even though you just ate to your ravenous food stays in your blood. Those are signs. Uh, also, um, very sluggish, very weak, blurry vision. But again, those are quite advanced symptoms that when I think of it as almost those, that one out of four person with diabetes who doesn't know they have it and has had it for a while. So your best bet is really check your A1C test. And A1C does have a limitation. I didn't mention that is, uh, you know, if you're anemic, then that number won't be right. Because uh, it is just measuring how much sugar is attached to the hemoglobin and the red blood cells. But most of the time, it is a good good test. Fasting blood sugar is always a good one too. That one doesn't rely on any on any anemia. That's fine. Okay. We have another question that came in. So we still have three questions. Um, what are low sodium alternatives to soy sauce and soup? Uh, alternative to low to soy sauce and soup. Um, with soup, I have definitely have seen, I even Trader Joe's has low sodium broth that is about, I think, 80 or 90 milligrams for a cup. That's pretty low for soup. And soup is usually 500, 600. It's, soup seems to be really, really extremely high in sodium. Um, soy sauce, we usually just tell people there's, a, there's the, the lighter, the lower sodium one. And that one, uh, we just learned to use a little bit, but um, to get those full flavors, um, there are some un, there are some some not some look. What are they called? The no sodium um, spices and seasonings that you see, like Mrs. Dash, but there's other ones that also help to bring a lot of flavor to food so that when you do use less of the soy sauce, you can still get a lot of flavor. So again, these salt-free seasonings that are, uh, you have to be careful with salt-free, but because uh, sometimes they'll use a, a different kind of salt that's called potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And potassium chloride is not recommended because we don't want to consume too much potassium in that form to be on the safe side. Potassium is usually a good thing in fruits and vegetables, but when you get it in, in that in that type of sugar, I mean, that type of uh, sub salt substitute is not so good. So better to have the sodium-free one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what are the typical symptoms or indicators of diabetes in kids? Oh, in kids, that's a good one. Uh, so in kids, what you see is uh, one of the big signs that you see when the kids are usually overweight, if you're talking about type two diabetes, type one is okay. quite different. And I think that's usually emergency room. You go in, kids are very lethargic, withdrawn, and there you can see that's more, that's emergency room sort of usually diagnosed. It's really quite serious. The type two diabetes in children, what you see is, uh, uh, it's called nigracan acanthosis. And what you see is on the back of the neck, 
and sometimes in the axillas, that's the armpit area, uh, kind of this dark discoloration of the skin. It almost looks like kind of dirt or dirty, like you didn't take a shower correctly. And you'll see this in like eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, 10, 11, 12, up to 18-year-olds in this dark colorization, uh, acanthosis. And that is a sign of insulin resistance. That means they have a lot of insulin. Their blood sugar may be normal and they'll go and they'll get an A1C test and say, look, it's normal. I'm just overweight. But if they check the fasting insulin level, they'll know it's high and they'll see that, that skin area. And that's pretty much a, really a, 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 a telltale sign that they're heading towards type two diabetes and inter intervention take place there. Usually the whole family needs to get involved because it's not a kid is in their environment. It needs to change, right? The whole household. Thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. um, this is the last question. If you are 25 to 30 and have family history of diabetes, should you start testing blood sugar regularly? Um, and this person specifies they're not currently watching their, their diet or, or anything like that. Uh, no, it's a good question. Uh, usually a doctor just does a, a A1C test at, at your, as if you're 40 and above, usually 40 year olds, 45, everybody gets an A1C, supposed to get, at least if you're 45, you're supposed to get an A1C test. But if you know you have that family history, it's good to get an A1C test. And that's probably the easiest way. And sometimes it's just once a year, just to make it part of your yearly physical. But yeah, no need to be checking your fingers. I mean, just, but it is good to ask the doctor for that. Not just the regular fasting blood sugar that everybody gets at all ages. You ask for the A1C test because of your family history. Thank you, Eric. That okay. was the final question for our presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'd like anything to add, you can add it right now. All right. Well, I thank everyone for, for coming. Appreciate appreciate this audience.